important guest. And we honor you, we salute you, and we encourage you to come back and visit with us the next one time. If there's anything that we can do to make your stay or your visit more enjoyable, yes, we just turned the heat on, and so we got the boiler going, and so uh, nevertheless, uh, we're, we, we got it together. We got it together, okay? But uh, the weather caught us by a surprise this morning, but nevertheless, uh, we are still moving on. Also want to say welcome to our members. Always good to see brothers and sisters come together to worship God in spirit and in truth. I'm excited today, especially we'll be taking the uh, our senior saints out to the Ponderosa uh, for a time of of uh, 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 fellowship and food and fun. We have a lot of fun. I believe that our seniors are very special people. It was very interesting this morning. I had one of those moments as I was thinking about our fellowship today. And the last time that we were together, Brother Dupree was with us. And I reflected and I remember him. And I said, you know, that's the way it's supposed to be. We need to always plan to get together because one day, one day, one day, one day. And so he's gone on to his heavenly reward. And the only thing that we can do is prepare ourselves to join and to once again look forward to that day. This morning, we are continuing with our series of lessons. Each month, we focus on a new core value. Our core value this morning is very, very interesting and very unique. We're going to be talking about self-worth, new self-worth this morning. And I like to begin by helping you to uh, to give you some cover because some of you are going to uh, going to be asked, especially our young people, they're, they're going to ask you, what did the preacher preach on? And somebody's going to say nothing. I'm going to truly preach on nothing this morning. That's right. I'm going to preach nothing like you've never heard before. I'm going to help you to understand the negative impact of nothing. I'm going to help you to realize that if you do not focus and grow and develop your self-worth, then you're going to be living a nothing less life. Now, let me ask you a question. Let me see how smart you are this morning. See if you're percolating. What do you see up here? Well, guess what? What do you see now? All right, you got it. Okay? When we talk about new self-worth, we've got to consider certain things. In the verses that we're going to be focusing on this morning, Jesus uses the word nothing to help us to understand the impact of being connected to Almighty God. As we look at the word nothing, I want us to focus for just a moment because this word nothing means unknown. In another sense, it means non-entity. In another sense, it means what? No, zero, nothing, nobody. But nobody wants to be nothing. Have you ever noticed that? Everybody wants to live a life worth something. Even though we spend a great deal of time trying to do this, trying to accomplish that, moving over here, doing this, we always find ourselves doing a whole lot of what? Nothing. Because we find ourselves trying to find ourselves. And as a result, we spend a whole lot of time doing what? You got it. So when you go out today, let people know that the preacher preached on what? Nothing. And it's nothing. <laughs> I'm trying to say it with a straight face. Because you know I'm right. <laughs> but nobody wants to be known as a nobody. Nobody wants to be known as a zero, but more importantly, nobody wants to be intimate. 
And this is what first self worth is all about. When we talk about the context of, of nothing, let us for, for a minute go over to the Bible. And let's look at a couple of things. In John chapter 5 and verse number 19, I hope that you have your Bibles because we're going to be reading several scriptures this morning as we talk about what? Nothing. John chapter 5 and verse number 19, it says, Then Jesus answered and said to them, Most assuredly, I say to you, the Son can do what? Of himself. You see that? The Son can do nothing of himself. But what he sees the Father do. For whatever he does, the Son also does in like manner. John chapter 5 and verse number 30. Look at your Bibles. Look at your Bible. I don't want you looking at nothing. John chapter 5. <laughs> I'm going to work this thing. <laughs> John chapter 5 and verse number 30. He says, I can of myself do what? Nothing. Notice what he's saying there. I cannot do or operate what? By myself. I can't do nothing by myself. As I hear, I judge. And my judgment is righteous. Because I do not seek my own will, but the will of the Father who sent me. Now, if you're one of those self-will people who no one can teach, you got your thing together. What Jesus just told you is that you're operating by yourself. And you're doing what? Nothing. All right. John chapter 8. Verse number 20. John chapter 8. And verse number 28. Slow it down a little bit. Let's get the Bible. John chapter 8. Then Jesus said to them. When you lift up the Son of Man, then you will know that I am He. That I do what? Nothing of myself. But as my Father taught me, I speak these things. If your self will, doing your own thing, nobody can teach you anything. You are operating in a matter, in a form called what? Nothing. But if we're connected to Jesus, you're listening to Jesus, you're responding to Jesus, then your life is the In other words, your self work. Let's go again. In John chapter 15 and verse number 5. John chapter 15 and verse number 5. Jesus says, I am the vine. You are the branches. And he who abides in me, and I in him, bears much fruit. I want you to pay close attention to that, but don't move too fast. I'm the vine, he says. You are the branches. He who abides, he who remains, he who stays put, he who lives, who, he who operates within me, within the boundaries in which he set. Notice what happens. You bear much fruit. For without me, you can do nothing. Apart from me, your intimacy. Now I want you to notice for just a moment. Because in John chapter 15, verses 1 through 4, 
He talks about a pruning process that's going to take place. That means that there are certain areas in your life that needs to be trimmed away. Some things need to let go of. Those things that which you had that you're holding on to, that you believe that it adds to your self-worth or it helps you to be who you think you are, some of those things you're going to have to let go so that you can be significant. You see, without him, you and I, we are insignificant. And if that be the case, then why do we live such unworthy life. Well, better yet, let me put it another way. Why do we live life without a faith? Let's think about it. Because when we look at the concept of self worth and new self worth, we're talking about a core value of Jesus Christ. You notice all those particular verses he went through and he talked about his self worth which was connected to the Father. And we've been pointing out several verses of Scripture throughout this series for this month and helping us to understand that we are worth something in God's sight simply because of what he has done to us and what he desires to do through us. Our self-worth is connected to him because apart from him, we can do absolutely what? Nothing, or better yet, things that are in Let's go over here for just a moment and just kind of help you to breathe for just a moment because, you know, when we talk about self-worth, our self-worth is dependent upon these things. First and foremost is to point out, how do we think? Do we think like Christians? Or do we think like Pan him, whatever you give me, Pan. You see, the Apostle Paul said something in Philippians chapter 4 and verse number 8. He said, finally, brethren, whatever things are true, whatever things are noble, whatever things are just, whatever things are pure, whatever things are lovely, whatever things are of good repose, if there's any virtue, if there's anything praiseworthy, meditate, think on these things. You don't have to clear your mind, in other words. You're going to have to stop putting nothing, that which is insignificant, in your mind. You're going to have to start thinking right. Because when you think right, you're going to what? Act right. It's also respect for the people. We looked at the scripture in First Corinthians chapter 16, chapter 6 and verses 12 through 20. But our main focus is on verses 20. But he talks about all of those things in, 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 in First Corinthians chapter 6 and verse number 12. He says, all things are lawful for me, but all things are not helpful. And then he goes on to list all of those things that are not helpful. They may be lawful, they may be okay in the world, but they are insignificant in God's sight. They're not going to help you, in other words, get to heaven. The only thing that's going to do is going to create more problems for you here and going to keep you from going up there. They're insignificant. They are. He goes on and he talks about it. He says in verse number 15, Do you not know that your body is a member of Christ? Shall I then take the members of Christ and make them members of a harlot? Certainly not. But do you not know that he who is joined to a harlot is one body with her for the two? For he says uh, that the two shall become one flesh, but he who is joined to the Lord is one spirit with him. Now remember what Jesus said. So apart from him, I can do what? No. Verse 18, he tells us to flee sexual morality. He talks about every sin that we commit. 
We're injuring ourselves. We're injuring our souls. We're hindering our souls. Then he comes back. Verse 19 says, Do you not know that the body is the temple of the Holy Spirit who is in you, whom you have from God? You are not your own. And this is the part I like. He says, For you are bought out of class. Therefore, glorify God in your body and in your spirit, which are God. Two things here. First of all, we are on loan from Him. Number two, we should live lives in such a way to where there will be no buyer's remorse on his part. You ever had buyer's remorse? You hate to see bought that? And you criticize? You see, new self-worth is also dependent upon our attitude. You look at John 10 and verse number 10, Jesus said this. He says, the thief comes not to come, the thief does not come except to steal and to kill and to destroy. I have come that you may have life and that they may have it more abundantly. You don't have to change your attitude about it. Stop living for nothing. I live with a person. You see, when we look at Second Peter chapter one and verse number three, God never intended for His children to live for nothing, because He has given us all things that pertain to what life and godliness. He has given us everything that we need to be effective in this life. But too many times we find ourselves operating from a base of nothingness. Simply because we are so wrapped up within ourselves. It is all about what we want, what we like, instead of what God wants. You see, that's what Jesus is teaching in those verses. It's not about me, it's about him. That's our purpose. Now let's understand. Let's get some understanding because when we talk about new self-worth, the world quickly says, well, isn't that the same thing as self-esteem? Sometimes, let's, let me help you out here because I've had this question, but well, that's self-esteem, that's self-esteem. Let me help you out. Self-esteem is a good thing. I'm not putting it down. I'm just expanding on it. Self-esteem is confidence in one own worth or ability, it is self-respect, a certain self-respect and self-pride, it is self-confidence, it's confidence, self-assurance, and watch this, a certain strain. <laughs> and this was an interesting definition. What is self-esteem? A certain mistraining for those who have low self-esteem. That's self-esteem. That's Self-esteem. But new self-worth is completely different. Here's why. Let me help you out. It's confidence in one's own worth or ability. Let me help you. Almighty God, the Creator, has placed a premium on you and me. Now, now, many of you have children, and you place a certain self-worth on those children. You know that no matter what that child goes, you're going to always love the child. You're going to come to that child's aid. They need that child could be completely wrong. Watch this. When you see as every parent realizes that he is a person, you know what? There's something special about that. 
And you as a parent, if, you, if you're smart enough and, and if you understand your role as a parent, you're going to do everything that you can to provide for that child so that that child can expand, that that child can grow, that that child can develop. And you're going to be pulling out the best in that child. You can do it, son. You can do it, daughter. You can do what you need to do. It's in there. Come on, come on, come on. And you're going to accept that. Understand who is the they embrace it with me. But at some point in time, at some point in time, that's not the real Here's a first step. And she should turn. That's when they check what is called the mission. Well, mama always told me, or daddy always told me, or my mentor always told me. Anybody ever had one of those moments? That time of revelation, that epiphany. And so as a result, now something happens to you because somebody somewhere gave you something, gave you some inspiration. Somebody reached out and touched you where you need to be. As a result, you raise up. You discuss yourself. Because of the connection that you have with the universe. This is how God says that. He recognized that his self work is not in himself, but it's connected to it. And you know something? This self work is so unique, it is so important that you and I need to realize what is the difference between self esteem and de self esteem? If I know and if I now, let's move on because the words of Jesus, you come back to them again. Remember those words? He gave you those words in John chapter 5 and verse number 19. Remember that? John chapter 5, verse number 19. John chapter 5 and verse number 30. He gave you that. Remember that? Remember that? Jesus says, I can't, be, I can't of myself do nothing. As I hear, I judge, and my judgment is righteous because I do not seek my own will, but the will of the Father who sent me. Remember John 15, verse 5. John 15, verse number 5 says, Hey, He is going to give us what we need. He's going to help us. He's going to help us to become because to see the abide in. Now, when you abide in Jesus, we're talking about a connection, a relationship. We're talking about a connection and a relationship. You see, new self worth is intentional living. That's just like this sermon on nothing. I had an intention for teaching on what? Nothing. My intention was to help you to understand that you should not be about what? You get it? Everything becomes personal. It's intentional. Living. Intentional living with and for a person. Now, most of you remember the story of Forbid the fruitless fruit trees. Do you remember those? Do you remember the fruitless fruit trees? Let's go over to Mark chapter 11 and verse number 12. Mark chapter 11 and verse number 12. And I want you to notice a couple of things about this text. It says, Now the next day when they had come out from Bethany, he was hungry, and seeing from afar a fig tree had leaves. He went to see if perhaps he would find something on it, and when he came to it, he found what? Nothing. Not only did he find nothing, but he found nothing but leaves. 
the appearance that it was worth something. The appearance was fulfilling its purpose. They were hungry. They were looking for food. The tree was created for food. The tree had a purpose. But when it came time for that tree to come, they found nothing that leave. It looked like it looked like it was productive. It was perfect. But it was not fulfilling. It's tough. Let's go again. Luke chapter 13. Luke chapter 13 and verse number 6. He also spoke this parable. A certain man had a fig tree planted in his vineyard. I'll wait for you. I love to hear pages. You gotta say amen. I just enjoy it. I am not to hear that my wife makes me do Verse 6, Luke 13. He also spoke this parable. A certain man had a fig tree planted in his vineyard, and he came six feet on it and found it. And then he said to the keeper of the vineyard, Look, for three years I've come seeking fruit on this fig tree. Find man. No. Cut it down. Why does it use up the ground? But he answered and said to him, Sir, let it along this year also until I dig around it and fertilize it, and if it bears fruit, well. But if not, after that, you can yeah, cut it down. Here again, we're faced with nothing. Both trees look productive. But the truth of the matter is, what purpose did they Purpose did they fulfill? What was the intended purpose for the fruit tree? Well, you know, bear fruit, right? But the truth that we've got to ask, we've got to ask this question, and we've got to get an answer. What were these trees good for? Huh? That's the question. Yeah. Let's make this clear. How clear the day you like. You know what you not only did he give you life, but because of his providence, he brought us all together at this point in time to receive this message. Can we do that? Can we agree and gain an understanding as to why we received this message was to examine our lives? Is that correct? Can we do that? Both of these trees had a purpose. You and I, we have a purpose. Can we agree on that? And our purpose is not for ourselves. Can we agree on that? We looked at certain scriptures here. We examined the scriptures. We looked at John, throughout John, where Jesus continued to use that word nothing. As it related, related to him and the Father. He was connected to his Father, which made him Come back. So now let me ask this question. If you were connected to Christ, but yet you seem to live in a role that is designed for nobody, can you really say, can you really say that you're living? If you find yourself wishy-washy, up and down, back and forth, you cannot seem to stay focused on that which is right until so you automatically place yourself in the nothing. Can we agree 
to the fact that you need to pray. That you need to be delivered. You will do it. If you, sitting here today, can look at the scriptures and see that there are some barren fruit trees or fruitless fruit trees, and the truth of the matter is they are trees that were designed to bear fruit, but yet they do what? Nothing. If God was to look at your life, and compare you to the fruit left fruit tree. Would he place you in the next mm-hmm. I don't know what you mean. But I do know this. That in Luke chapter 13, I want you to know this. In the first three, in Mark, the patience of God was very swift. He cursed the people. Stop the And somebody would say, well, he didn't have any patience with the tree. We don't know how long that tree did. Just like I don't know how long you've been on this earth. Come on. Has not the people been looking at you? No. Let's go again to the second thing, which comes to the point. The fruitless fruit tree, which is designed, created by God to bear fruit, its purpose was to provide fruit for those who were in need, who were hungry. Its purpose was to serve other people. Now, when it, when the time came for them, to, for that fruit tree to do what it was supposed to do, it was not what? Ready. But the patience of God is extended by one to intercede on behalf of the people. Do you see that? Is Christ interceding you? Is he pleading with you? Is the Holy Spirit working on you, calling you to surrender? Now we'll read the several things. Can we agree to this? If God is calling, are you going to reject the time? And execute nothing. You don't respond. You're executing nothing. Which you really don't have to do. Nothing requires you to do nothing at all. Remember, it's zero, not insignificant. So when the call of God comes to you, you're either going to do something or you're going to do what? If you do nothing, you're going to continue. If you didn't hear the call, then you're going to reject. Which allows you to do what? The Bible tells us what we need to do. Paul talks about it in 
Romans chapter 1 and verse number 16. He says, For I'm not ashamed of the gospel, for it is the, it is the power of God unto salvation for those who believe. Let's go over there and just turn it up for just a moment as we prepare, as we prepare to wrap up this lesson. I want us to look at this because sometimes we, we hear scriptures, we hear scriptures and we become so familiar with them and so it's good to go back, go back, and go back once again. But in Romans chapter 1, in verse number 14, I want you to notice the Apostle Paul says, I'm a death for both to the Greeks and to the barbarians, both to the wise and the unwise. In other words, I'm no longer nothing, but I'm what? Something, not because I'm executing my purpose. He says, I'm ready to preach the gospel to you who are in Rome also. For I'm not ashamed of the gospel of Christ, but it is the power of God to salvation. I want you to notice the next one. For everyone who believes. Now I teach the gospel to individuals. Constantly and consistently. Even the individuals who think that they are right in the sight of God and they'll look at the gospel and say, well, you know, I didn't really do it that way, but I, you know, I'm good to go. Well, let me tell you something. If you don't understand the gospel, then quite naturally, you cannot obey. As a matter of fact, if you don't understand the gospel, but yet you say that you did something, but the truth of the matter is, you did absolutely what? Why? Because it wasn't in accordance with the Holy Spirit. You see, the gospel is the death, the burial, and the resurrection of Jesus Christ for your sins and for mine. Christ died so that we might be raised. But what we've got to do is that we've got to connect to the Father. And the way we do that is that we simulate the gospel. We obey the gospel. How do you do that, Paul? Romans chapter 6 tells us how. If you will, give me some time and let's look at this very seriously. We're living in a time now that where anything is okay, you do what you want to do. We've even got so smart to where you talk to a person about truth and they'll say, well, that's your truth. Not mine. Let me tell you something. God is the inventor of truth. I don't have a truth. It's here. Just listen to something. Oh, that's my truth. My truth is. No, 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 no. It's God's truth. Let me tell you something here. Verse number two. Do you not know as many of us were Baptized into Christ, were baptized into his what? Death. That's true. Therefore, we were buried with him through what? Baptism into what? Death. That just as Christ was raised from the dead by the glory of Father, even so we should also walk in what? Newness of life. Now, 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 now you very smart people, you got your Bibles open. When did newness of life begin? After baptism. See that? See that? That's what that is to see God's word. Which could be very different from what? Which is. Not a thing. But it is. And to think for those who what? For those who what? So do you believe that this is the right way to be saved? Because if you do not believe that this is the right way, then you are absolutely positively believing in what? No. I told you the lesson we're going to do about that. You didn't think you could learn anything about nothing, did you? Let's finish up with Paul. Let me come to And then the lesson is there. Verse 16, if I'm not ashamed of the gospel, for the power of God, power, the gospel of Christ, but it's the power of God is salvation for everyone who believes, for the Jew first, 
and all fit for the gate. You know what he's saying there? It's there the back. There's the back. Black, white, yellow, green. There's some blue people on the earth. So them too. There's the back. Okay? You know. For in it, this is very important. For in this gospel, the righteousness of God is revealed from faith to faith, as it is written, the just shall live by faith. Watch this. I want you to look at that part. It says, the just shall live by faith. Let me help you out. The gospel justifies us. That means that we can stand before God just as if I had no sin. The gospel, my obedience to the gospel, it now allows the grace of God to rest upon me because of my obedience to this gospel. I can stand with Paul, Peter, and the rest. I know. I chapter 10, verse number 38. Says, Repent and be baptized for the remission of your sins, and you shall receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. Acts chapter 5, and verse number 32. Watch this. He says, Those who obey the Lord, He gives them the you know, gift to them. What kind of obedience you talk about? If you read the entire chapter, the special aspect is the individuals who turn in their lives to the God. The day you see. Can you agree on this? Can you agree that God is calling you to something greater than your thought? Your thought? Your idea is all you see it. And it's left up to you, whether or not you We have the elders in training here to help. I'll be down here to help. Whatever you need to get yourself together and to find your new self worth, that's what you do. This is not a game. Nor is this just some religion. This is the life of Christ. To be lived out in this world, you have a purpose. And only you can feel your purpose. I can't feel it. Every day. God is calling you. I encourage you. Do not care. Do not care. Do not care. Today is fruit inspection. Will we find fruit? Or will he find what? Whatever your needs are, make them known. You're starting to find the invitation. 